Time now for another award-winning edition. I don't know. I, I'll give us an award. We won an award? Uh, yeah, sure. Why not? I, I give you that podcast, uh, <laughs> Royals Podcast Award uh, from the program on Sports Radio 810 WHC. Uh, Seren Petro, Randy Gisarly, the good doctor, Randy Gisarly, uh, with you talking Royals baseball and much to discuss a winning baseball team. Uh, it's been a long time since uh, on this podcast we can talk about a winning baseball team, but we will do it. Uh, Royals completing the four-game sweep this afternoon of the Chicago White Sox. Uh, we will talk about uh, whether or not this team is as good as it looks. Uh, is this the best, uh, I don't know, rotation in a generation? Maybe uh, at least a decade? Uh, how far back do we have to go to find a rotation that's been as good as this one has? For albeit 10 games, it's still just 10 games. Uh, Bobby Witt, the MVP candidate, uh, where's the room for this team to improve? We'll touch on the stadium boat uh, failing at the end of the Kaufman Corner podcast. It's coming your way right now. You're listening to Kaufman Corner, the most in-depth analysis of the Kansas City Royals, breaking down the Royals like no one else can. Kaufman Corner is hosted by Randy Gisarly and Seren Petro. Randy is a co-founder of Baseball Prospectus, author of Randy on the Royals, and former columnist for Grantland, The Ringer, and The Athletic. Seren is the award-winning afternoon drive host of the program on Sports Radio 810 WHB in Kansas City. Kaufman Corner is proudly brought to you by GAN Asphalt and Concrete, Kansas City's nationally recognized full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor, making parking lot problems disappear since 1994. Free consultations, no commissions, in-house crews, and every project comes with a written warranty. Find them online at GANASphalt.com or call 816-484-3338. GAN Asphalt and Concrete, one contractor, all things parking lot. Now, here's your hosts, Randy Gisarly and Seren Petro. Thank you, Curtis. We do appreciate it. Uh, Petro Gisarly with you, talking Royals baseball. Proudly brought to you by our friends in Can Asphalt and Concrete. Happy 30th anniversary to Can, making parking lot problems disappear since 1994. Uh, 224. Let's see, that's, yeah, that's 30 years. 30 years they've been doing it. Uh, Randy, pop quiz to start things off before we oh. get into some of the uh, topics. When was the last time the Kansas City Royals were two games over 500? Ooh, two games over 500. Just I was, a I was, two games yeah. over, which they are now at six and five. Well, I was going to, I was going to lead us off um, by saying that we started this podcast. I, I looked it up. Our first podcast was April 10th, 2022. Okay. So opening After opening weekend 2022, the Royals were two and one. Little did we know that they would not be above 500 at any point in any season until what episode is this now we're we're, we're well into the hundreds now so <laughs> uh this this is uh episode 110 110 episode 110 the royals are back above 500 for the first time in in the history of this podcast after our first one yeah. i'm gonna guess at some point well, let me think 2020 i i want to say in 2021 they actually got off a really hot start in april so April 9th, it was just the day before our podcast, which is what I found interesting. Oh, they, uh, they were 2-0 before they were 2-0. Right. Okay. They were 2-0. Sure. So that's the last time they were uh, two games over 500. When was the last time they were two games over 500, 10 plus games into the season? Then I that's think in, in, in April, I know that in April of 2021, they were off to like a 16 and 8 start and then they collapsed. So probably in May of some point that year, they were still above. Oh, oh, oh ye of little faith. They went all the way out to June 5th. June fifth, twenty one. June fifth, okay. they were twenty nine and twenty seven, and there was a belief that this thing was going in the right direction. As we know, it would crash hard and burn uh, from there. But yeah, I, I thought that was interesting. One, just because I thought I was going to be going all the way back to two thousand and seventeen, maybe, you know. But no, two over is not hard, especially early in the season. Ten games over, uh, they were fifty six games in at that time. So that is of note. But I think I'm going to have fun if they can continue to be above 500. We know we don't have to look at two over for you know a while. And they and you are right. A lot of these things are just going to go back to 21 uh, because they, they did get off to such a good start in 21. But somewhere along the line, when we get past June, that's going to be the first time in a long time right. if the Royals continue to play successful baseball. Let's begin there, Ranny. Are they as good as they looked so far? Yeah, I mean... 
that's a loaded question because how how good have they looked? Are they the, the team that is six and four? I mean, maybe, you know, but, but if you extrapolate six and four out to, to, I mean, it doesn't sound like oh, a great record, but if you go six and four every 10 games, you win 97 games. Right. You know, that's a 600 winning percent is, uh, you know, a, a championship caliber ball club. Um, do I think they're a 97 win team? No, I do not. But for a six and four team, like when the Royals were two and one, when we did our very first podcast uh, two years ago, yeah, they had a winning record. They had won, I think they won their first teams one nothing and three to one, and then they lost 17 to four. So, like, even at two and one, they had a negative run differential. Do you know what their run differential is right now? Uh, off the top of my head, I did not look at that. I, I can tell you pretty quickly. I'm sure you'll tell me. Yeah, I mean, they're they've they've scored 44 runs and allowed 25. Like that uh, hang on, plus 19. Yeah, uh, so plus 19, cor- correct. I was going to say plus 19. <laughs> correct, Mr. Subtraction. Yeah. Um, but the, the ratio is even more important. I mean, it's almost a two-to-one ratio of runs scored to runs allowed, which is a testament to their pitching staff. And the offense is averaging, what, that's 4.4 runs a game. Fine, nothing spectacular, but okay. Averaging 2.5 runs allowed. That's impressive. That is a, that is the sign of a team that is playing at a considerably better than a six and four record. In fact, like that, a team that outscores its opponents by that's probably seventy five percent. That is going to lead to a seven hundred winning percentage. So, like, they're not lucky. They're actually kind of unlucky. And when you think about what happened, um, losing to the Orioles in the, the rubber match when they had a three nothing lead going into the eighth inning, um, and you know Will, Will Smith. Uh, spontaneously combusting again in the ninth and, and blowing that game. Like they could have very easily, they, it was very frustrating at that point because they were two and four, despite having outscored their opponents, they could have very easily turtled. They got a huge gift from the schedule uh, creators because they got the Chicago White Sox. They really needed to take advantage of a bad team. Um, but to their credit, they did, they swept them. They, you know, they destroyed them in the first game. They pulled it out in the last three games, the bullpen, much of bullpen didn't give up a single run in all four games, I believe. Um, and I, I do wonder if we're going to look back at the, the, the white Sox in the context of the season, the way we kind of remember the 2003 Royals and, and, and the fact that they were extremely lucky that they played in the same division as the 2003 Detroit Tigers, one of the, you know, the, the losing his team in American league history. And, the opportunity to beat up on that team was a huge factor in them being above 500 that year. But the Royals, I think, are a legitimately better team than that 2003 team. And they're going to play the White Sox, I think, 13 times. The schedule's not quite as unbalanced as it used to be. Um, but they took full advantage of it. They, in good, Look, good teams are supposed to beat up on bad teams. That's exactly what they did. Well, we've, we've run the numbers many times, Curtis and I, on, on the radio show. Um the program on Sports Radio 810, 2 to 6, little plug if you ever checked it out. Um, and, and listen, all the championship teams, they go pretty much 500-ish against the other winning teams. And they pummel the bad teams. Right. Like, that's how you get there. So, you know, I, I'll take a shot at, you know, it, you know, is this team as good as it's looked? Um, yeah, it is. They're not 500 against the good teams. And they're well above 500 against a really god awful team. You know the sample size is still small, which is what we're both getting at here a little bit to a degree. Uh, we know they can handle the White Sox. They're going to get a pretty good evaluation now against the Astros, the Mets. Um, you know, have finally started winning a couple of games after an 0 4 start, but they look like at least a, a middle of the pack team. We're going to know a lot more. I, I said going into the first 10 games on opening day, look if you can just go one and two, one and two in your first two series. Then go three and one against the White Sox. You can come out 10 games and be at 500. That's pretty much what they did, except for the one and twos, as you pointed out, were disappointing. You felt like you should have been better. You weren't just hanging on by your fingernails to like, okay, we got pummeled 20 to six. They were one and two. And in each case, the win was a blowout. Yes. Right. And the losses were close. So that was, and it it was frustrating. And yet it was also kind of, you know, an optimistic tone for the season. So, from that standpoint, I think taking, you know, sweeping a four games uh, series, which is hard to do against the bad White Sox team, doesn't seem like luck in this case. It looks like they were kind of overdue. Some of the bad luck they had early came back against the White Sox. The one caveat to your point about them not being a 97 win team is the bullpen. And Will Smith today 
got the job done. But I mean, the last out he got, I think it was the last out, was a meatball. Why it wasn't crushed into the stands, I don't know. It was a 76 mile an hour, dead over the middle of the plate that should have been teed up and destroyed. Instead, it was lofted straight to the left fielder. That he throws that pitch, you know, all season, he's not going to finish the year on the roster. He'll be released. Like he needs to be better. And I will say this, at least he wasn't in there for the ninth, unless they thought that was the leverage point in the game. I have to go back and think, cause I was watching the women's national championship game while I was watching the Royals game uh, at the same time. So I don't remember where the white Sox were in the order uh, when he was there, but if they thought that was a leverage situation and Will Smith's still their leverage guy, you know, let the beatings begin and happen quickly because I don't see it with Will Smith right now. Well, I mean, absolutely. I, I do not. I mean, the, the, the concern I have with Will Smith, you know, after his third outing, the, the loss to the Orioles, it wasn't simply that he'd been destroyed in two out of his three outings that, you know, average pitchers, decent pitchers, even, you know, good pitchers will occasionally have screw ups like that. Um, what concerned me was, was very simple. His fastball average fastball velocity season by season going back to 2016 i wish i had i don't have the numbers pulled up but i mean i can pretty much show you off the off my uh noggin because they were so incredibly consistent up until this year it was 92.6 92.3 this is year by year his average velocity on his fastball um here i've got the numbers now um yeah so so average fastball velocity 92.6 Ninety-two point three, ninety-two point seven, ninety-two point four, ninety-two point six, ninety-two point six. This year, ninety point two. Yeah, two and a half mile an hour drop. I don't need more than two or three outings at that velocity to to know there's something seriously wrong here. And you know, when when he came out to protect a one run lead, I think it was Friday against the White Sox. And, you know, the world, the world's had a one-run lead go to the top of the ninth, and they brought in Will Smith. I mean, I was, for for a moment, I was pretty furious with Matt Quintero. I'm like, you, I, got, I got it going into that third outing, but he's just blown, you know, a one-run lead, or two-run lead, actually. Or, no, a one-run lead in the ninth. And then his, his velocity's down. You bring him back out again in the ninth inning. But to Quintero's credit, he got the first out, then a double, then a walk. And he didn't let, he, Quintero did not let Will Smith stay in the game long enough to lose it. He pulled him mid inning and it was, there was with an, a, an air of finality. You watching Will Smith come off the mound. You, you figure, you know, he kind of knew the, clo- he not just was coming out of the game. He was coming out of the closers role. Right. And he brought in James MacArthur, who, who had also been hit a little bit in his first couple outings, but very different vibes, three strikeouts, no walks coming into the game. Like he had given up some soft contact. He'd given up some hard contact, but there was nothing inherently wrong with MacArthur. His velocity was fine. He might be at this point. I mean, the one thing we, we've talked about with his bullpen is they don't have any hard throwers. MacArthur still is as close to a hard thrower as they've got. Um, along with that that deadly slider, they brought him in two pitches, got a double play ball, game over. So the Royals get the game, and you know they they solve at least the, the the dilemma of what do you do with Will Smith? How how do you break it to him? He's no longer the closer. So that's why today I was not at all surprised he came in in the eighth inning. And yeah, he he got the he got out of it, but he is very much a a, a weakness on this team. They used was it uh, Chris Stratton yesterday to protect a three run lead. It was a, technically a save situation. Um, so they have some interchangeable parts here. And in the long run, I mean, look, even if Will Smith turns out to be a terrible. Uh, you know, pitcher and they have to release him or whatever. It still wasn't a terrible contract. It's a one-year deal. One year, five million. You they did that with him, with Chris Stratton, obviously. They brought in Nick Anderson. You know, like if you bring in three, they brought in four new relievers if you count Schreiber as well from outside the organization. You know, one of those four guys is probably going to be a turkey. But yeah. the point is they can they can cut bait very painlessly with one of those guys. The key is not to let those guys lose you three or four or five games before you finally acknowledge the inevitable. Uh, the Call of the Quarter podcast is proudly brought to you by our friends at Can Asphalt and Concrete, serving the greater Kansas City area. Can Asphalt and Concrete, nationally recognized full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor. Parking lot problems, they've been making them disappear since 1994. Don't let accidents and liability issues be the centerpiece of your parking lot. Have a smooth, beautiful parking lot. Get it restriped today. Everything. 
that comes with fixing a parking lot. Again, asphalt and concrete does it. A brightly striped lot will cut down on accidents. Keep your parking lot as safe as possible. Let you focus on business and give a great first and last impression to any customer, any client you have. Again, asphalt and concrete, one contractor, all things parking lot. To your point, I, I'm not quite as rosy about MacArthur as you are because it was, I mean, one inning, one run, one inning, one run, one inning, two runs, right? Three innings is his first three outings, three innings, seven hits, four runs, three strikeouts, no walks. I do like the strikeouts and no walks, but there was plenty. And yes, not all of them were rockets. Uh, it's your, your point is valid. I am optimistic. You said the velocity is not down. So I'm optimistic that he's going to be fine, but <clears throat> you know, it's interesting how much just three and a half days makes because I had my weekly chat with Jeff Passan uh, on Sports Radio 810, and he comes on every Thursday in the 5 o'clock hour. So if you want to catch that podcast, you can. Every every Thursday, Jeff's on in that 5 o'clock hour. But, you know, he's like, look, you know, I, I mentioned all the positives like you and I discussed. Like, hey, they're scoring runs. Uh, that's going well. Uh, the starting pitching's incredible. And he's like, yeah, but how do you see the bullpen getting better, right? If not Will Smith, then who? And MacArthur pitching better the last couple of times helps. Schreiber looks better. But I think that would be one of the questions if they do, you know, I it it, it doesn't, it still doesn't look great. You know, he mentioned, he goes, how about Jordan Lyles? You know? Future, uh, future Royals closer, Jordan Lyles. Well, he, hey, he's, you know, he's been one of the best pitchers on the team so far through two innings, but hey, any, anything's possible. Um, but you, you, what you're saying is valid. Yes, the bullpen is a problem right now, but actually the fact that the Royals are 6-4 and four and have outscored their opponents by 19 runs with a bullpen that's a problem is actually one of my reasons for optimism. Because yeah. if you're going to have a problem, you can fix a bullpen mid-season. You can't really fix the lineup mid-season you can't fix the rotation. If I mean, you can fix one spot, but if you've got like half of your rotation is, you know, cannon fodder, you're you're not going to fix that very easily. The bullpen, you got eight guys out there. If you need to replace three or even four of those guys as the season goes along, somebody will probably emerge from the minor leagues. We'll, <laughs> we'll see who that might be, but of course, you you always can you can make trades for relievers mid season. You don't and you don't have to, and if you if you don't necessarily aim for like the top uh you know the top of the market so you don't get burned in you know trade trade cole reagan's for a role this chapman or whatever like you can usually if you're if you're savvy about it you can trade some low level prospects think about all the the borderline relievers the 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 the, sev- the setup men that the worlds have traded over the last 10 years before a world chapman and what they got in return and and in most of the, in many cases, they got a, a prospect that never even made it to the major league. So, if this continues to be a problem, there are ways to fix it in July or even sooner. Um, but the key is to to sort of survive in the meantime. So, the, to me, though, the story, and we'll get into this now, is is the rotation. Like the rotation has been <laughs> phenomenal. Even in ten games, even in a small sample size, when's the last time the Royals had a ten game stretch like this out of their rotation? I don't know. Did you did you look it up? I I mean I I tried. It's it's hard to to search. I can search games, but it's hard to search games by um, by role. So I couldn't like there was there's I don't have the ability to like say when was the last time the Royals had ten consecutive starts where the starter gave up like three runs or less. But I don't have to because uh, I believe it was Nick Capel from the Royals themselves that found a, a really I mean it, it's a kind of a weird step, but it's kind of incredible in a way. The Royals, in in their first nine games uh, before today, seven of those nine games, their starter went six innings or more and gave up one run or less. So six. So let's call it a super quality start. Right, quality start, six innings, three runs or less. So six innings, one run or less, a super quality start. In the history of baseball, no team had ever had seven super quality starts in their first nine games. So, I mean, it, it's a, again, it's a kind of a weird constellation of numbers, but that is, it, you you would not be able to come up with even a weird constellation of numbers that puts the Royals as the best start in Major League history, unless they were pitching really, really well. I mean, they lead the Major Leagues in ERA out of the rotation. It was like 126 coming into today, and, and 
Uh, Alec Marsh had their worst start of the season, which was still three three runs and four and two thirds, and kept the the, the the team in the game, obviously. Um, but this, the rotation ERA is well under two. That is phenomenal. That was not going to happen with Cal Eldred as pitching coach. Like, you know. Quietly, we we, we, we uh, Chiefs fans will you know will say that you know the, the the quiet MVP of the Chiefs season was their defensive coordinator, right, Steve Spagnuolo. The quiet MVP of the Royals through ten games right now might be Brian Sweeney, because that rotation is there. There are no there, everybody is pitching at better than expected, at least as well as expected, and there have been no screw ups. I mean, Alec Marsh could have very easily gone south, and he looks like a significantly better pitcher than he did last year. Brady Singer looks like good Brady Singer. Lugo and Waka have been exactly what we expected. All right. Uh, I, I do on Singer. I mean, maybe he's made the slider even nastier, and he can pit throw it that many times. I I still wonder what's going to happen the days the slider is not there. Sure, sure. Right, and and maybe those days are going to become fewer and farther between. Right, but. I he, he's still only throwing a couple of changeups here and there. I mean, it's still craps and giggles with that pitch, and and that does worry me a little bit. That this is like like for one, we because of a final four, because of spring break vacations, um, Easter Sunday, and the final four, we've yet to do our fantasy baseball league, which will happen on Friday and Saturday night. And so I'm watching all these things happen. Uh, things like I was going to go for MJ Melendez, no matter what. Now, <laughs> I was going to get him for like seven or eight bucks, I think. Yeah. Even in with Royals guys, now I'm going to have to go 20 if I want to get him. Anyway, I'm watching these things unfold. And like Brady Singer, I was kind of excited about making a run at Brady Singer. Figured I wouldn't get him because we got five Royals guys in the in the deal. But like right now, I'm like, uh, I'm kind of glad because I kind of want somebody to go pay $21 for him. Be it Because I think he's, I think this is, he's over his skis a little bit. Right. And I don't just mean the 0.68 ERA. We all know he's not going to better Bob Gibson's, you know, ERA record. I, I I get that. But I just think that there is a regression coming with him. Maybe not as much as before, because I do believe, you know, talking to the Braves, I remember in spring training when the Royals were in Florida, talking to Tom Glavin and yeah, about, you know, competing with Smoltz and Maddox and how that was a thing and how they made Kevin, Kevin Millwood was made better because he wanted to go with those guys. I think this is real. And I, I think it speaks to part of the reason why the Royals did this was to make not only the competition that, you know, Daniel Lynch, you don't just get a job, but also those who do win a job. Hey, you got to keep up Brady. You're not the number two guy on this Ross on this pitching staff, unless you can really flat out go. And I think that's been a great success and worked really well for, for what JJ Piccolo was trying to do. So the, the, I'm going to throw something at you that might make you reconsider. I'm not, I'm not saying Brady Singer is the 0.66 ERA guy either, but you say, well, you know, he's, he's what what will happen when his, his uh, slider's not working because, you know, he's still not throwing the changeup very much, and he's, you know, the same two-and-a-half pitch pitcher he's been all along. Except he really isn't because he's now a three-and-a-half pitch pitcher. Well, he is the four seam right. fastball. He has is, thrown it eight, according to baseball savant, eighteen percent of the time this year. According to Fangraphs, twenty one percent of the time. He what's threw, the slider percentage? Uh, that is about the same as it's always been here. Let me, according right. to Fangraphs, um, it was oh, actually a little bit. He was it was forty two percent last year. It's at forty nine percent this year. So I mean, it's been two starts. That's that's you know a couple uh, extra pitches. Absolutely, absolutely. But the point is, he's. He threw, according to Baseball Salon, he threw five forcing fastballs all of last season. It's a new pitch. It's a new pitch. And, you know, uh, the sinker and the slider both have negative vertical movement. They both move down relative to gravity. The four-seamer moves up, right? It it, cha- it changes the eye level. That's the term that you, you like to, you know, you'll hear from announcers, changing the eye level. And, you know, even the changeup moves out. Like, now he actually has a – in some ways, the, having a four-seamer, if it's effective, might do more to keep hitters off of his sinker and his slider than the changeup. The changeup has has uh, benefits from a horizontal movement perspective because it moves in an opposite direction from the slider. But he's still throwing that about 5% of the time. But if this four-seamer takes, he might now have enough of a repertoire to be a legitimate number two starter. So that's something interesting. And again – was that something Cal Eldred was working on? No. Brian Sweeney, they, the Royals have been trying to find another pitch for him for a long time, and maybe they, I, now they found one. It is impressive how 
it, you know, more than a year and a half removed from uh, Cal Eldred being fired, you've managed to work him in here several times already. <laughs> and I bow to your ability to, to thread him into this conversation. But I My will say, memory is extremely long, Saren. I will and say, I do not forgive. Right. I, I I will say two things. One, not in Cal Eldred's defense, but just in a reality. Sometimes you got to fail and feel like you're up against it. Like and bring guys in for Brady Singer to change. If they don't bring in Waka and Lugo, if they're not making these moves, is he willing to try another pitch? Or is he just like, I'll show up and go? And I also would not whistle past the 138 batting average on balls in play that is currently working against him. Now, you know, I, I, I think it was uh Jason Stark who once said to me about Danny Duffy when he was going well. Some guys can just induce funky contact. Right. And maybe that's what this pitch does for Singer. Maybe now this is the if we get all the pitch overlays, we're like, wow, look at all the spots. Here's the same delivery and look at all these balls drop out of the different spots. And so maybe this is it. Maybe this is the final piece of the puzzle. I I, I certainly hope so. Um, but I do expect not not beyond just the point sixty eight, a little bit of a regression, but a little bit of a regression is it, still I, I do expect this to be his best season. Right. I still am bullish on that. And and that makes him a good pitcher. Right, maybe not great, but makes him a good pitcher. And when you pick, by the way, when you pick a guy twenty-one, I know for this franchise it was the one time that they were picking kind of high in in recent years. And so the idea is that well, he's their first pick, so he's got to be an ace. He doesn't have to be an ace. If he's a three, that's dandy for picking a guy right there. That's fantastic. You've done your job. Yes, can a guy overachieve, or can a guy come from what was it? Brett Sabre was the nineteenth round or whatever. Can you come from the nineteenth round to be an ace? Sure, you can. But if you take a guy in the first round and he goes on to be a number three starter and you picked him that low in the first round, you did your job. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I think Brady Singer just being a, a quality number three starter would be great. That's, I mean, the, the, the Royals have a rotation that is Cole Reagan. Like, the, the thing is, they found an ace without, you know, not in the draft. They got him in a trade for a reliever with two months left. So all they need from the other four guys is to be number three starters. And Al, I mean, Alec Marsh just be a good number five, right? The, to me, the, the biggest concern we have right now, the, the, the thing that will determine the success of this team, I think, as much as anything over the, the remainder of the season, is simply can they stay healthy? Because I don't know what they do if they need to d dig into a sixth or even seventh starter. Right. I mean, Daniel Lynch is down triple A. He's pitched fine, but I think he's like five strikeouts in 10 innings. Like that's that's not somebody that I think we can rely upon as more than a, an occasional spot starter. Chris Bubich, we hope. We'll be back midseason, and that's if this rotation can hold it together until then, they may have a nice a nice option in the second half if they need somebody to fill in. Um, but beyond that, I don't know where they go. I mean, it's to the credit of the organization and, and to JJ, and even well, give credit to John Sherman for spending the money that they went out and signed two starters. And so far, it's again two starts, but they have done what they're supposed to do. They look healthy. Um, which is no mean no mean thing when you look around the, the sport and how many guys are being felled by Tommy John surgery and you know Yuri Perez is is out Shane Shane Bieber is out for the season like you know hard throwers tend to get injured more often and actually in a way aside from Cole Reagans nobody on the staff throws that hard which I mean you'd love to be able to throw hard but it does kind of protect you on some level from the stresses that can blow out your elbow with a single pitch. So if the if the rotation just stays healthy, I think they're going to be they're going to have a starter that can keep them in a game every time out. And there's enough offensive firepower here to keep, you know to to make them a, a 500 team if not better. Yeah, no, I I I do agree and um you know, I, I look. Waka is going to be Waka. He's not going to be as good as he was the last time. But the, the combination of the two, he's going to go deep into games. And and listen, I think with Seth Lugo, there is upside. He's never been a starter till last year, right. so there was a reason to believe that there would be upside there. Upside, I thought there was upside in Lugo. I I, I thought we were going to get what we were going to get out of Michael Waka. But then with the other four, there was upside left, and that's not easy to do. And Cole Reagans is delivering. Uh, so far, Brady Singer is delivering. Seth Lugo is de delivering. And Alec Marsh may not be a star, but, you know, a cheap fifth starter allows you to go pay or even overpay for a Seth Lugo when you can have your fifth starter be Alec Marsh and not have to go pay $10 million for someone else like that. So I have a trivia question for you. Lay it on me. Alec Marsh, what do you think his career ERA was in the minor leagues? Well, I know he got blown up 
uh, a couple times. I mean, not good would be my guess if there's not enough. How bad? Was, How bad do you think it was? Uh, five fifty. Now you're cl- closer than I thought. Five seventy-two. Okay. I mean, he has he has good stuff. Like he has a ninety-six. His fastball is like ninety-five, ninety-six as a starter. And he, he actually, I, I, I think I, I tweeted that he has like five pitches. According to Baseball Savant, they they record six different pitches for him. A sweeper, a sinker, a four-seamer, a curveball, a changeup, and a slider. Maybe that's too many pitches. But the point is, you throw that hard and you throw that many pitches, it's always kind of been a mystery why he has struggled so much in the minor leagues. Well, but- and, and, and to your point, not to, you know, sorry to interrupt you, but to your point, this kind of goes back to your Cal Eldred. I'll, I'll beat the drum yeah. once, right? <laughs> like, you know, guys like JJ Piccolo that are running the minor league system and, and the, the operation are saying this guy has stuff, right? I'm not giving up on him, but when you keep handing him to people that don't know how to unlock it, exactly, it's not going anywhere. So th- that that's where the move and, and to John Sherman's credit, they finally made it with Dayton Moore. This can't be your uh, the good old boys club. It has to be guys that can come in and, and make things happen. You know, that, that, exactly. And that's my point. That's my hope that what we're seeing from Alec Marsh, he get two starts. It wasn't great today, but he's been, he, he looks better than he did last year. But again, he looks like he should have been dominating all along, certainly in the minor leagues. My hope is that this is a reflection of development, of pitching development, of coaching, and that the Royals may have maybe doing a better job in that regard than they have in the past. Um, in which case, maybe this is sustainable. Maybe Alec Marsh can turn into something close to the pitcher that his stuff says he can be. Because if if he is as your number five starter, then you have a re- you have an above average rotation. I mean, just saying above average rotation doesn't sound like a lot, but if you have an above average team, you're in the playoffs. Like that's the way baseball is now. So, um, you know, especially because the lineup, you know, we're, we're, we haven't even talked about them yet. I mean, it's, it's all the Bobby Witt show, but. There, there's like there's actually star players on this team, both both in the rotation and in the lineup, like to a level we haven't seen in a while. Yeah, no, let's talk about Bobby Witt. Uh, by the way, we're brought to you by Gan Asphalt and Concrete, uh, the nationally recognized uh, Gan Asphalt and Concrete. Thirty years in business with free consultations, no commissions, in-house crews, plus every single project comes with a written warranty. Reason why GAN customers have been so satisfied. They keep your parking lot safer, help you focus on your business, everything you need, whether it's the concrete bumpers, the signage, the striping, the seal coating, or building brand new GAN Asphalt and Concrete. One contractor, all things parking lot. Find them online at ganasphalt.com. Bobby with the MVP candidate. You ready to declare? Are you ready to, to, to run his campaign, Ranny? I mean, I was ready before the season. I said he would be the, the, best finisher by a Royal in, you know, whatever, 40 years. Um, and by God, like, I, but I, even when I said that, I, I hedged it by saying, you know, top three, top two. When I wasn't prepared to say he's going to win MVP. But this is sort of how you do it, right? With a combination of performance and narrative. Performance-wise, I mean, okay, he went, what, over four today with, a, I think, granted a double play, but he came in with 1.3 wins above replacement in nine games. Like, he's the best player in the American League. He's hitting for power. He's playing shortstop. His defensive metrics have been like even better than they were last year in nine games. He's doing everything except stealing bases. Actually, he leads the league with three caught stealings. But you know, no one's perfect, and you know that 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 will even out over the long run. Um, but so you have the the performance. Then the narrative is well, yeah, the Royals are six and four. Like if the Royals are a playoff contender this year, the narrative will shift to. You know, Bobby Witt being the the young cornerstone of a of a surprise team. There's ab- there's already MVP buzz from non Royals fans that I'm hearing, at least in the sense of keep this guy on your radar. Um, so, you know, the Royals they both got that contract done in the nick of time because I'm feeling even better about having him for the next seven years than I did before. Um, everything he, and the other thing is when we talk about performance, it's not just okay, yo, he's slugging average, batting average, etc. It's the batted ball metrics. He's hitting everything hard. He's hit nine balls, I believe, this year, 110 miles or more. No one else has more than five in the majors. And those two are Shoei Otani and Mookie Betts. That gives you an idea. Those guys have hit five five balls, 110 miles or harder. Bobby Witt is at nine. He's the hardest hitting player in the major leagues. He's one of the fastest players in the major leagues. 
And he's a good defensive player at the most important defensive position on the diamond. Like, yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing a superstar unfold. Like, we've had stars. We've had really good position players since George Brett retired. Carlos Beltran maybe was the closest we've had to a true superstar. But this is Carlos. He's turning into Carlos Beltran at shortstop. That is uh, that is exciting. Because when you have a player that good on your team, it's it's, it's hard to lose 106 games. I'll tell you that. Um, but it, it, you, you have one superstar and everybody else is average. That's eighty. That's an eighty-eight, eighty-nine win team right there. So, um, I, I, I can't think of anything I, I can say about Bobby Witt that isn't positive at this point. Like everything looks good. You know, I'd like him to maybe take a few more pitches, but even that, it's, it's, wow. it's not danger. It's not Salvi Perez territory. Like he's, he's learning the strike zone with time. If you want to dig in for something, he's two of five on the base pass. Yeah. Yeah, it's the it's the it's the cot stealings. I think he's just a, he's just probably not picking his spots. Maybe he's a little bit too aggressive, and that may be some of it. The team telling him to go, so they need to dial that back a little bit. Like he doesn't need to steal bases to be an incredible base runner because he takes you know extra bases on hits all the time. First to third on a single, first to home on a double. That's where his value is primarily as a base runner, anyway. Yeah, no, I I agree. Yeah, yeah, and yes, he is an MVP candidate. Um, and if this team stays in contention, he. He's got a good a fighting chance to win it as anybody, right? I mean, you know, I I, I don't, you know, who, who's who won it last year? I'm trying to remember. It was Shohei Otani, I believe, and he's now in. Oh the yeah, that's right. yeah. Well, well I was. Thinking, well, that's that's why I was thinking. I was like, uh, yeah, I had him in the National League and forgot that he was was in the American League. Right, exactly. He's been gone for so long. Uh, <laughs> you know, I put him out of my mind. Uh, so yes, yeah, so he doesn't have to compete with that, which helps uh, quite a bit. Uh, there are other guys. When yeah, Juan go. Soto is the other cross league guy who's now in the American League and might be, you know, at least in the early season, is getting a lot of MVP buzz because the Yankees have played well and and he's over hitting well. It's very early, obviously. It um, is, but he's and, a legit candidate at yeah, this point, which is fantastic. Like that's not not something we've had very often in Kansas City for for in, decades. In, in May, we'll caucus. Uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, does he stay in the race? Uh, I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, you know. That, that, that's what, uh, you know, the season's all about. Where is there room for improvement, Randy, beside the obvious being better at the back end of the bullpen? Right, right. I mean, the bullpen, you know, that's the big one. And again, that is actually a token for optimism because that is something you can improve upon. Uh, I mean, I'll tell you where we can improve right now is is our is our much maligned defensive corner outfielder um, who, guess what? MJ Melendez, not Bobby Witt, leads the team in OPS right now after yet another uh, go-ahead home run. Um, you know, the, the, the room for improvement, we need, we, Pasquantino needs to start hitting, right? Like that, the, you know, and again, this is one of those also the, the, the opposite of uh backhanded compliments. It's actually, it's, an, it's a critic, it's a critique, but it's also reason to be optimistic is they're doing all of this with no production from first base. And I'm not worried that Vinny Pasquantino has suddenly forgotten how to hit. I am worried he may not be a hundred percent yet, and he may be working his way back into playing shape. Like I think about like Bryce Harper came back last year um, from Tommy John surgery and came back early and had basically no power for like the first two months uh, after he came back. And then from August on slugged over 600. So my hope is Pesquino looks a little bit, I don't want to say lost at the plate. He's, you know, he struck out the walk ratio is, is fine. Um, although the last two or three games, I think he was pressing a little bit because he was starting, he was starting to expand his strikes on a swing of pitches. He shouldn't have. Um, and he got the day off today against a, 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 a really tough lefty with a, a low arm slot. Like a, I actually really liked the way Cotero used the lineup today and benched a, a couple of left-handers. He benched Isbell and Passman, you know, MJ was the only lefty in the lineup. Um, so hopefully, you know, he gets his head clear. I, I don't expect a lot of pop from him right now. My hope at this point is he just starts getting on base. Okay, just take your singles, get on base until the shoulder works its way back into 100% and he starts hitting for some pop. But that would be an area of concern if he doesn't come around, obviously. So that's hey, you like, Yeah, you like to see a getaway day with, with the backups and then the bottom of the lineup producing, mm -hmm. right? That That's what was impressive today. I think it was six for 15 overall out of five uh, through nine. So with a, with a walk, well, you know, when Hunter Renfro hits a home run, you better win that game, man. You better take advantage. So the Royals did to their credit. Well, and, and, and listen, and I agree. And he was both of our picks to be the disappointment this year for the Royals. And so I, you know, but if, 
if this team is good enough, if MJ Melendez is emerging as a real screaming bat in the middle of your lineup, right? If that's going to happen, um, and, and hopefully Vinny Pascantino is going to be Vinny. Bobby Witts, uh, an MVP candidate. Michael Garcia setting the ball in the air more. Then, then Hunter Renfro doesn't have to be as much. Right. I mean, it, look, he, it was a very well-timed home run against a really tough pitcher who, like, in the first four innings, Garrett Crochet, I, you know, I, he looked like a young Chris Sale. I mean, there, he, he his slider looked like Randy Johnson against Salvador Perez. I don't know if you caught some of the at-bats today. Go back. Salvador, it, it was a horror show because he kept throwing this unhittable 82-mile-an-hour slider at Salvi's f- shoe tops, and Salvi just could not resist swinging and was – it, it looked like he was pitching to, to you or me. I mean, it was really that devastating. And then he makes one mistake, and Hunter Renfro makes him pay with a man on base and it turned a 3 nothing game into a 3-2-2 game. And they pulled him after that inning, and the Royals came back and win. So, like, yeah, Hunter Renfro did his job today. And that's all, you, you know, the occasional home run will will make up for some, some deficits. The guy you didn't mention, Nelson Velasquez, is hitting 296, 367, 593. Terrible spring training. We didn't know what we were getting. We we're like, there's no way he can be as good as last year. And he, there is no way he's as good as he was last year. But through another 10 games, he's hitting as well as he did last year. I mean, there is, you know, there's still, there, there are three or four lineup spots that there are going to be a struggle here. You know, we're hoping Kyle Isbell will give you enough to make his defense play. You're hoping Renfro does something for you. Um, second base is, you know, still kind of uh, up in the air. We're waiting for Michael Massey to come back. He, uh, got a, got into a double A game yesterday and went 0 for 4 with four strikeouts. So uh, clearly he he needs a little bit of time to get back into shape. Um, so they have some holes, but they have star t- like star level hitting ability right now. Not just at shortstop. I mean, Melendez and Witt and Michael Garcia and Nelson Velasquez and Salvador Perez is not you know is not showing any signs of age today. Notwithstanding, like they actually have like four or five really good hitters in their lineup right now. So even if those guys come back to earth, if we can get some production everywhere else, they might have an average to slightly above average lineup, which again, give me an average lineup, an average rotation, one superstar and Bobby Witt, you're knocking on the door of the, of the playoffs. Well, and, and have an average lineup with an exceptional rotation. And then let's hope for an average bullpen. Right. And now you're in a pretty good spot. There, there are multiple ways it can go. Like I'm hoping the offense, like the, the rotation will never will not be this good all year. But there hopefully will be times, there, like you said today, where they get production from the bottom of the lineup. I mean that's that's what won them the game today. It wasn't a great start. It was it was actually the bullpen and the bottom of the lineup today. So you're going to have games like that. Yeah. Uh, the the question then becomes where are you going to get uh, help? Uh, do, do you believe in help downstairs coming anywhere? It's going to be tough. They don't, I mean, they don't have a ton. Uh, there isn't a lot of cavalry coming this year, right? We're talking about just finding somebody in the bullpen. Um, speaking speaking of bad starts, John McMillan was the guy who was really hoping for being you right. know, up there with MacArthur as a huge, um, you know, jolt to the bullpen this year. And he finished last year with a strained forum. The worry was, oh my God, does he need Tommy John? He didn't. At this point, though, I'm wondering if he might, maybe he still does. And if and if he does, maybe it'll be a, a you know, a mercy or at least an explanation. Because, I mean, he went out yesterday, I believe, and in AAA, faced four batters, walked all four of them. So that's, you know, that that's a problem. Like John McMillan at this point, you, you, you hope he turns things around. You hope that if it is an injury, he gets fixed. But right now, you can't count on him at all this season. So you're looking at Steven Cruz, who pitched a little bit last year for the Royals, uh, and Will Klein. Those guys both throw, they, the, those guys both throw in the upper 90s. They'd be the hardest throwers on, on in the bullpen. If if they get called up, they are both having command issues. All right, there you can't you you got it. You got to stop walking seven batters per nine innings in AAA before you earn a spot in the major leagues. Like the one guy, actually, frankly, the one guy who might get called up, and this is the first time his name will appear on this podcast. Walter Pennington is a left-handed reliever. He was one of the, the guys that was signed in 2020 when the draft was only five rounds, and the Royals signed all these like college seniors afterwards, who has been just kind of a nondescript reliever, left-handed reliever in the minors for years, but was the talk of spring training. He was striking out like 60% of the batters he faced in spring training. And so far in five and two-thirds innings in the, in Omaha this year, one hit, two walks, eight strikeouts. Maybe he's a, a late, you know, late career bloomer and might be a find. But right now, there isn't a lot of help in the in the bullpen in AAA, which is why I think they're going to probably make a trade if they stay in the race. They'll probably trade for an arm in June or July. 
Uh, by the way, a couple of names to uh, uh, put on the radar screen that or that were on the radar screen and how they've gotten started uh, down in AAA. Daniel Lynch, not good. Uh, he has started two games, 10 innings, 15 hits, five earned runs. He's given up two home runs. He's walked three and struck out just five. Yeah, no, Daniel Lynch, like I said, he's, he looks like a finesse guy in AAA. As a, if you need an emergency start, fine. But I don't, I don't, I don't see this turning into he's going to be a mainstay of your rotation. Unfortunately. No. And then, as far as the hitters go, Nick Prado, who a lot of people were hoping and thought maybe had made the ball club, said, "Well, let's go down to the minor leagues and hit." Uh, two eighty six, four twenty nine on base, three fifty seven slug. Uh, he's got uh, two doubles in his eight hits. Uh, no home runs yet, but four twenty nine on base, two eighty six. Uh, he's walked seven times, struck out nine. Yeah, the key there, the key there from my perspective is just the, the strikeout rate. Nine strikeouts and 35 plays. It's about a 26% strikeout rate. That's improvement for him. Right. It's still not where it needs to be, but he needs to keep it around 25%. If he can do that and start hitting for power, he might, like, if if Pasquantino does not come around for whatever reason, you know, I'm, I'm glad we have Prado there as AAA insurance, but I'm glad the Royals send him back to Omaha and didn't panic and, and send Nelson Velasquez down because, again, spring training stats can fool you. But they, they usually do. Couple other guys, more good news, at least to a degree. Drew Waters, 333, 391 on base, 381 slug. Uh, not hitting the ball over the wall. It's it's early, it's cold, what have you. Uh, stolen a couple of bases. Uh, he has walked twice, struck out six times in his 23 plate appearances. And so he's at least surviving and getting on base. Uh, if there's a piece of bad news, uh, Tyler Gentry is a guy that a lot of people have kind of thought, okay, hey, maybe. Maybe he'll be the guy. Uh, 136, 269, 136. Uh, OPSing 406. It's been a terrible start for Tyler Gentry. So it ain't the Orioles, right? You see the 26 <laughs> run uh, performance yeah, the, the Orioles. Nor, nor folk, the, 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 the Orioles, like I said, f- f- hire somebody from the Orioles that, you know, the, from their hitting development department because what the Orioles are doing with, with hitters right now is like borderline magical. I don't know what's going on. Um, Keston, uh, Heston Kierstadt, who was the, uh, second pick in the draft, the, the cursed Asa Lacey draft where, I mean, the, the one defense you could say about Asa Lacey right now is that like that first round, all the guy, all the guys picked at the top of the draft look are, are, have been disappointing because they had the second pick in the draft that, uh, that year, they took this, uh, college outfielder that people thought was a reach, but, um, he has hit very well. He's a, he's a top prospect in eight games in triple a this gives this tells you how good the norfolk lineup has been he has 25 ribbies in eight games 25 rbis if he has a three rbi game his average goes down yeah that tells you how good he's hitting but also everybody in that lineup is getting on base they're putting up a 10 spot in every game it's crazy um so yeah, no, we don't. We do not have that. That's that's the thing. If there's if there's really one red flag about this start, it's just that they have to stay healthy. What one of the underrated aspects of this team? They have not made a single transaction since opening day, and that may not sound like much in ten days, but not one player has been injured. Not one player has been demoted. Not one, like they have the same twenty six guys that started the season are still out there, and right now they kind of like, they kind of need everybody to stay healthy. Um, you know, Will Smith, okay, if, if he's not, if, if the velocity stays down and he struggles, maybe they, you could probably call up, there's probably one or two relievers you wouldn't mind being your eighth guy in the bullpen that you could call up for AAA. But right now, this team has very, very little depth. All right, let's close with this. The latest, your view, you you want to uh, preach some optimism. I shared with you a, uh, a Facebook, this was a big thing at the end of the week last week. I can't remember. This was, this would have been on... Uh, I don't know what day it was. Um, Friday or Thursday? When did the, the vote was Tuesday. Mm-hmm. So it would have been, maybe it was Wednesday or Thursday. I, I, I think it was more like Thursday or Friday. Uh, a Facebook grab from the wife of Royals owner John Sherman. Unfortunately, neither team will work with Jackson County again. Uh, she said in a comment on a public Facebook post. They had been working behind the scenes for two years, attempting to get uh, a location approved, which was, I think, Frank White's plan all along. In any case, most unfortunate for sports fans in KC. Uh, the lack of leadership has lost the city two treasured assets. Lost. Past tense. Pretty sure they're still playing there, but lost. Past tense. I mean, if you don't support the Chiefs after three Super Bowl wins, why should they stay? Uh, we will be lucky uh, if both teams 
wind up in Kansas, at least still in the area. This is an unwise decision by the owner of John Sherman, and I think speaks to the tone deaf of the rich. One, you're chastising the voters. I was going to say, I, when you say Jackson County, this Frank White didn't, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure he voted against it, but Frank White is not the reason why you lost the vote. Like, Well, I think, I think it's an effort. 16 points. Well, it's an effort to say that Frank White stalling along the way is why they couldn't get everything to the voters, and the voters then would have understood it better because everything happened at the last minute, which is, listen, was Frank White a problem? I don't know. Was Frank White just looking out for his constituents? I don't really know. I've talked to him. I've had him on the air. Uh, I know what he wanted was was money coming back to Jackson County out of this tax, at, which I, you know we've talked about. The math doesn't really add up to that. But that's not a horrendous thing to try to do right. unless it's, well, he knows he can't get that through. And so he's just filibustering basically to not let this thing happen. Okay, but it's still on you to release a plan. And the Royals and Chiefs were not able to get Kansas City, Missouri to give any details of what their part of the equation would be, to get the state of Missouri to give any details. You know, the 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 voters either said no to giving billionaires money, to which there's a valid reason to do that, or they said no to giving them money without knowing really how all it's going to be spent and how much more of their money, because all Jackson, not all Jackson County residents, but many of them are also Kansas City, Missouri residents and state of Missouri residents. And so are they giving $400 million to each team and then signing off on a, a, a tax increase of whatever, or at least funding, public funding, on two other levels of their government, paying these teams even more. So it's just, it's arrogance, it's it's billionaire disease and thinking because you didn't get what you want because you say it when you're rich, because usually you can get whatever you want whenever you want it, that you can just say whatever you want. This is a really, really bad idea. I hope these are not the thoughts of John Sherman, and I hope they acknowledge and recognize the mistakes that they made along the way. I completely agree. I mean, it's incredibly tone deaf at best. Like this, the voters, the, the voters in a way did the world a favor by rejecting it so soundly. Like this isn't a, a you know, if it, if it had been a 48 to 52 vote, then, you know, the, the Royals could say, you know, could, could maybe make a compelling case that, well, you know, they they were, like you said, uh, stonewalled by Frank White all along. And they didn't, you know, the, the voters didn't have a chance to to see the plan until, you know, through no fault of their own. When you lose by 16, it was a bad plan. You know, like I we, we tried to stay out of like talking too much about this until last week. But like when we talked, one of the things that really did it for me was the the, 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 the fact that six days before the vote. They are agreeing to like change the plan to accommodate, you know, the Oak Street businesses. And th th to me, that was just an eye opening moment. It's like you are asking people to vote on something that is shifting at such a late moment that you're 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 basically telling all the voters six days ahead, whatever they're voting on is probably going to change after the, the vote. And I just that is the the planning for this was so poor that I think the voters did the Royals and probably the Chiefs a favor by rejecting it because I'm not sure I have any faith, even if it had passed, that the stadium that they would have ended up building in that location, which has some geographical constraints, especially if you're not building across Oak Street, was was going to be small. Either was going to be, you know, they, they were going to have to cut corners in terms of the size and scope of the project to make it work, which you would have spent all that money and felt like, oh, you know, we didn't get the perfect ballpark. We spent all this money and we still feel like we left something on the table in terms of the, the, the grandiosity of the project. Or it would have turned into an enormous boondoggle afterwards and would have been a PR nightmare and probably, you know, cost overruns, et cetera. Um, and from the chief standpoint, I still have absolutely no idea what, what the chiefs were going to do with all that money. I mean, they're, they're, you know, uh, a, a, a fan activation zone and in VIP access, like what on seven four hundred million dollars for what? Um, and when I, when you heard after uh, uh, heard from multiple people after the vote that they got a, a letter from the Chiefs, um, like you know, addressed from Clark Hunt, you know, encouraging them to vote yes on on this proposal. That they got this letter from the Chiefs the day after the election. Just, I, you know, we joked about it. In their defense, there has been postal problems. <laughs> but, you know, you probably need to anticipate postal problems when, when you know, you've spent half a million, whatever, a couple million dollars, I think, on, on lobbying yeah. and, and trying to get this passed, and you can't get, like, letters in the mail in time. It, yeah. it does make me think the Chiefs 
didn't particularly care. Like if, if they could get money out of this, great. If not, they, they, my prediction is the Chiefs are probably going to end up in Kansas when all is said and done. Ten years from now, they'll probably have a, a brand new stadium uh, in Kansas. They are, you know, probably salivating at the opportunity to talk with the governor. And, you know, Kansas is probably salivating at the opportunity to get the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, I still think for the Royals, though, a downtown stadium, they, they, they're having an urban stadium for baseball is so much more important than I think it is uh, for football. I think this will force the Royals to go back to the drawing board. This is not a wholesale rejection of the idea of spending uh, money to give the Kansas City Royals help building a new stadium. I think it was a specific plan or lack of a plan that the voters were rejecting. And I think that they may have done them a favor because they'll have to come back with a better plan, more fleshed out, um, with more buy-in from the community that's going to affect. And maybe it'll take an extra year or two. Like, you know, the Royals seem to be rushing this for for no reason I can discern. Yes, you, you, the sooner you get the stadium, the sooner you, you can start printing money. But it's going to be a 50-year stadium. So, you know, you're going to print the money eventually. Print print it right, you know, and you'll pr- probably print more if you put it in the right place and you without alienating your, uh, you know, your, your fan base. So I still think the Royals will end up with a new stadium. Um, and I'm hoping it'll be a better one than the one they, they proposed this time around. Yeah, I think they'll come back and they need to put the whole plan together. If they have a plan, you know, whatever Frank, Frank White's role is in this, good or bad, then they need to get that fixed, right? Either by cutting him out of the equation, publicizing what it is he's doing that's wrong and getting him out of the equation. But they need the answers that people clearly didn't have. And that is where is all the money going to come from? Where, you know, how is it going to fit inside Oak, you know? Draw the draw. Give us an accurate drawing, for God's sake. You know, and and I think then it could pass. But yeah, it's it's disappointing. Yeah. Well, well one thing, you know what will help what will help it pass if they keep winning. So yes. tie it all together. You know what? It's wait. You know, there's some cynicism about why the world's only spent money in free agency to, to to get this vote passed. Well, if the vote didn't pass, but guess what? They made the team better, and that's all. I, you know, that's what we really should care about. And more power to them if they did. And if this team is good, if they go to the playoffs or whatever, it's going to be a hell of a lot easier to convince their fan base to vote for something in the future. So, um, you know, all I, I, I refuse to believe hope is lost uh, for a new stadium. Um, and I, I honestly believe that this might end up leading to a better stadium project in the long run. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Uh, we're proudly brought to you by Gain Asphalt and Concrete. If you've got any problems with your parking lot, there's one contractor that handles all things parking lot. That's Gain Asphalt and Concrete. Find them online at gainasphalt.com. A programming note will be on Monday next week because Randy's got some travel stuff going on. So uh, it'll be Monday. If you catch us via the podcast, remember, we stream live normally at 10 o'clock on a Sunday. We'll be going 10 o'clock on Monday, the 15th. Tax day. We'll get to the bottom of it. By that point, on the 15th, uh, we'll have, what, eight more games? Mm -hmm. Uh, We'll be done with eight more games? Or the Royals have a day off in there, maybe seven. I don't know. I'll have to look at the schedule. Uh, Anyway, we'll have a better picture on the 15th. They will be two, four, six, eight more games. Eight more games into it. So we'll have a better picture of where this ball club is going after having played uh, the uh, Astros. uh, No, seven more games. Astros and Mets. Astros and Mets. And uh, they will have played the White Sox. Uh, that night, uh, they will have thrown on one against the uh, White Sox. So we'll break it down then. For the good Dr. Randy Gisarelli, I'm Soren Petro saying thank you very much for joining us here on Kaufman Corner.